This is the new TC Pride Podcast, Episode 37, Part 1 of Building Bridges, with Representative Aaron May Quaid. TC Pride Podcast. We are on location in Apple Valley with Representative Aaron May Quaid. Well, Representative Elect, technically, right? You're going to be inaugurated soon. How, how does that? How does that feel? How does that sound to to hear Representative in front of Aaron May Quaid? I feel very honored because it means that people have selected me to represent them, and I'm very keenly aware and tuned into the fact that I am a representative and all of the honor and privilege and duty that that carries um, and representative elect. It's like, it's just around the corner. I'm waiting. Can't wait to be sworn in. (laughs) Well, you know, it was, it was a tough race for, for anybody that, that followed your, your race. There were certainly some, some unique challenges that that you encountered along the way. Of course, in a tough race, endorsements always help. You did get one uh, little endorsement from some guy, some, some guy that maybe Barack, something Obama, something, right? What, right? Barry Obama, like a President Barack Obama. Yeah, no, that was, um, it felt very full circle for me because I started this whole career of mine working for President Obama, then Senator Obama. And it was um, to know that he inspired me to continue to be an organizer and an elected official and then have his endorsement just before I became an elected official was, it was, it meant so much. And um, he's still an amazing man. And I, I've appreciated having him as a leader for the last eight years, and it gives me a great model to look to handling yourself with dignity and grace and intentionality. I'm I'm really looking forward to to serving and and using his discipline for um, words and his discipline in democracy. I'm looking forward to using that myself because I can be a very gregarious person. I can be a very outgoing person, like a let's do this, let's jump on it and go, and to approach things with a little bit more discipline, a little bit more restraint to build bridges and to bring people around a shared idea is something that I will be doing. So I've been curious, where, where were you when you found out and what, like, what, what was that like? Did, did you approach that moment with restraint or did you like, sc- I would have like totally freaked out and screamed, but, but what was that moment like? Well, it was like three 30 in the morning and every other election had pretty much been called. So from president on down. So for me, I, I use the analogy. It was kind of like, um, I went on a very public, hike to the top of Mount Everest and then there was an avalanche and they thought everybody died and then I like crawled back to camp and then they were like oh my gosh you lived and they were really excited and I was like yeah but everybody else died (laughs) is kind of how it feels um so I was the last race I found out about and at that point I was pretty devastated about all of the other results and so it felt like a very small hug on a bed of knives, sliding sliding down a banister of knives into a pool of alcohol. This would be like getting one Band-Aid. Because <laughs> democracy takes a lot of people, and I'm just one person, and I'm very aware of that. And I know that it takes partners from all levels of government to move a progressive agenda and to move an agenda of equality and liberty for all people. And so I felt like, how am I going to do this? How am I going to carry this all on my own with all, without all of these people I thought that would be joining me in the state legislature and joining our Congress and, and moving into our White House. And so for people that have been listening to the Twin Cities Pride podcast, you, you've actually been on the podcast before. Um, you were actually in our episode that we did from the vigil um, for for the Orlando uh, victims. But for people who aren't familiar with you, um, would you like to maybe just tell people just a little bit about, about yourself in general and just your background in politics? Sure. So I was born and raised here in Apple Valley and in this community that elected me, which is wonderful. Um, And I, you know, I was I went to the University of St. Thomas where I majored. This is my joke. My wife doesn't think it's funny. I think it's hilarious. Uh, I majored in the three things that you're not allowed to talk at the dinner table or religion and politics. So I was a poli sci justice and peace studies double major with a minor in theology. Um, When I my, my father who's black and my mom who's white, they made sure that my brother and I were exposed to black culture because we live in a very white state and we live in a very white suburb. And so I remember uh, being in high school or maybe it was between high school and college and my dad gave me this book. He was like, hey, here's another black guy from Chicago that you'll probably like. And it was the book Dreams for My Father. And I remember reading it and thinking, oh yes, this is exactly what I want to do with my life. This is, well, I mean, one, it tuned into a lot of the things that I think and feel sometimes as a, as a biracial person. Um, and so I remember going into college and telling people what I wanted to do after graduation is work on Barack Obama's presidential campaign. And at the time, he hadn't even been elected senator. And so they were like, who now? Um, and so 
to have that realized right after college was amazing. And so I worked on President Obama's campaign in Denver. I came back to Minnesota. I worked on Governor Dayton's election in 2010. And then in 2014, I worked for Congressman Keith Ellison on his campaign side. And then I joined his official side and I work on uh, policy and outreach in his official office in Minnesota. Now, there, there were actually people at the uh, at the Orlando Vigil who maybe are familiar with you, but maybe they don't know you by name. There, there was actually a moment um, at the Vigil that that was a particularly powerful moment that that you kind of um, became known for. Um, could you maybe talk about that just a little bit, please? Absolutely. Um, so the moment would be when Ilhan and I held hands and raised them up as uh, you know, intersectionality wove its way to the black lesbian from the suburbs to the first Somali legislator from the city. And, you know, all of these things that um, people see, people who haven't really had a chance to look at their legislature, look at people in power and say, yeah, that looks like me or yeah, that embodies a lot of me. Um, they look at us and they see those two things. And so for us, you know, we're friends. We talk on the phone and make jokes like I know that Ilhan likes running and I think that's hilarious because I hate running. And so I tease her about it. And so to me, you know, Ilhan isn't um, the first Somali legislator. She's my friend Ilhan who won in Minneapolis. And um, so for us, we thought, how can we translate this wonderful friendship that we already have into something that's some, like that shows people that this isn't hard, that coming together, that loving people for who they are and who they love and where they're from and what they do is is not hard. It's easy. And so that moment, I think, for us was really powerful because there's a lot of days where I think her and I just feel like two regular people and we're not. You know, we're, we've been elected by our communities and we also embody, we're more than just representatives for our community that, like, geographically, we're representatives for communities that we represent. And... Um, I was really glad to do that with her and I needed her that day. I mean, she was standing behind me and she was leaning on me and I was leaning on her because we were just sad. We we needed each other. And so to share that with everybody else, to have everyone else feel that love in that moment was was really powerful for us. Yeah, I think there was an overwhelming sense um, that night that like we all need each other too. And I think that moment really sort of embodied like what a lot of people were, were feeling. And, and I, I was just thinking there might be people listening to the podcast right now going, oh, that's Aaron May Quaid. Okay. That's, that's who that was. So um, you, you did mention intersectionality a couple of times. It's a big word and it's, it's kind of a new word sort of, you know, in the, in the broader sort of conversation about like racial equity, social justice kind of thing. Um, and you mentioned it on that episode of the podcast. Can you sort of just talk about sort of what it is for maybe people that maybe aren't as familiar with the concept? Absolutely. So just first of all, we'll give props to Dr. Kimberly Crenshaw, who coined the term. Um, an amazing black woman who does a lot of racial equity talks throughout the country. Um, so for me, you know, I am a black woman. I am a lesbian. I am a young person um, and I'm from the suburbs. And so that's some intersectionality where there's already things that women carry as women, right? We walk to cars with our keys between our fingers. And then when you're a woman of color, if you're a black woman, there's even more um, stuff that you have to go through. And then if you're LGBTQ, there's even more stuff. And so you put all those together and it's um, a lot of identities, minority identities, I should say, that we have sectioned off groups, right? I have my LGBTQ community, I've got my black community, I've got my woman community, I've got my suburban community. And so for, I sit in all of them and I'm black and white. So then I sit like in all of these different communities and I think learning to navigate yourself and um, where you where you sit at the intersection of all of those things. And I, I'm really good at code switching. I'm really good at, at being comfortable in a lot of different places because I have to be. And I'm also what I call a bridge builder. I'm able to communicate across these intersectional lines with different groups. So like in the LGBTQ community, I can maybe talk about POC issues. And in the POC world, I can talk about LGBTQ issues. And to black people, I can talk about white people. And to white people, I can talk about black people. And so that's why I consider myself a bridge builder because I have to be one. I, by my very existence, I am one. So when we talk about intersectionality, we talk about a bunch of different uh, minority identities that are all existing in one person. You mentioned that you grew up in the suburbs, so and you represent Apple Valley, which is a pretty suburban part of the Twin Cities. Um, and what I got from listening to you tonight at this community event here is that um, is that a lot of the concerns that people have out here in the suburbs um, can be can be pretty similar, but a lot of the battles can can be pretty different. Um, in fact, you said about being a community organizer and fighting for social justice in the suburbs. Uh, you said something like, we are the kind of people who people who oppose our point of view fear. Um, you know, when we look back at the battles that the LGBT community and other marginalized communities have won and are fighting now, 
Um, battles aren't always only won and lost in the cities. Uh, suburbs aren't typically progressive strongholds. Um, how is fighting those battles in the suburbs different? I think, so the, the first thing that I'll say is when I was door knocking this year, a lot of people, when I said, what issues do you care about? Or, you know, what do you want to see change? A lot of people were like, you know, I really like my life. I really like my community. I think it's pretty great. And then they would maybe transition into like, but my neighbor or my kid or my aunt or my, you know, sister. Um, so it would be a lot of other people's concerns that they would bring to me. And I think that speaks to some of the stability that we have in the suburbs. And that's not to say... Um, you know, everyone is stable. The reason I started running was because poverty at my elementary school went up 380% in less than 10 years. But no one knows that. No one was talking about that. And I feel like, um, you know, when we let a lot of silent issues stay silent in the suburbs, then we are complacent in letting them continue. So childhood hunger can no longer be a silent issue, and it certainly can't be one here. And that is, you know, it's why I started running. And I see, you know, I knock on doors. I told a story tonight about um, an elderly woman who was, I believe, 79 or 80. And she told me that the biggest concern to her was, and she said, I quote, I don't know if I'm using the right word, but it's diversity. I want diversity to be important and good in this community. And so what I recognize about some of these battles that happen in, in, in the city, because they're really, you know, there's no problem that's just like a black people problem or a white people problem or a kid problem. Like these are our problems. We all do better when we all do better knowing that um, sometimes it's the language or the distance from the hubs of where some of these conversations happen on a daily basis that keep us out of it. It's not lack of caring. It's not um, not support. I mean, we had a long conversation tonight about Black Lives Matter and some of the concerns that the women were saying, you know, I, I want to go do this, but what if I get arrested and I can't be like a PCA for my kid with autism? Like that's a very real concern. But then have we given people another way to support BLM with, you know, without going and protesting? I don't think so. And so um, when I say the battles are different, I mean that we're kind of separated sometimes by the ways to fight these in our own way that are meaningful to our community that uh, acknowledge the time and energy and the way that we want to do it because we just have not been included in the conversation. And then also we don't have people out here who are willing to bring the conversation here. And so I think so often I find my role as someone who's willing to show up, someone who's willing to provide the language, someone who's willing to have the conversation or invite people into the conversation. Uh, and I want to continue to do that. Like I said, I'm a bridge builder. So the more I can elevate the people who are in this community who want to participate in fighting for equality and liberty because there's so many, but they feel like they're the only ones. I, I told so many people, the next four people down your street also think the exact same thing that you told me and they'd never talked about it. And I think that's the other thing too, is because we want to maintain this, you know, safety of all of our spaces. And it, it kind of gets hard if you're going to have a conversation with someone that's your neighbor, you're going to live with next to them regardless of how that conversation goes. And so why wander into dangerous territory um, and put yourself out there, especially if you haven't been given the language to have it comfortably. So um, I see myself as, as a leader on that, helping people um, actually fight the battles that they're already wanting to fight in the first place. It's just uh, banding us all together to do it as a community. Awesome. You were you were featured in Star Tribune uh, shortly after you were elected um, on an article they did about how uh, the number of women in legislature um, is, is increasing right now. And um, you were quoted in that story saying, you said, we know when women are part of the process, things get done and get done well. People are sick of the gridlock of not getting things done. And to that, I say, we need more women. Um, so less than 1% of legislative seats nationwide are, are held by women right now. Um, and how, how do we get more women and minorities and other marginalized communities involved in politics? I think a lot of it is what you see tonight. Um, one of my core focuses as a legislator, but not in the legislative body, but in my community, is to be a civic educator, to help people understand how our government functions, who represents them, how they're elected, what their role is, demystifying you know, the, the levels of government as they exist, particularly the county level of government. I, I say this all the time, but I really want to do that because no one knows what their county commissioners do. Um, so... I, I think back to the election um, or before the election and there was a candidate forum where it was six women, two men. 
And we had two minutes to answer a question. Every single woman, both Republican and Democrat, we answered in the time allotted. We would just stop in mid-sentence when the time was up when they held up the stop card. The only two people who used all of the time and more were men. And so even though we vehemently disagree on pretty much everything, at the end of it, the women are standing around going, why won't they just shut up when their time is over? They insist, they see the stop sign. They just insist on talking past, you know, the timekeeper, so on and so forth. And so there is this shared experience that women have that I think bring us together more so than men do. And I always say, and I don't have children, so let me qualify this, but I do say that I think because women create humanity, we just don't look for ways to destroy it as much. Um, And so I think that our inclination, no matter how much we disagree, is to find something to do together, find some way to make this experience, whatever it might be, positive, find some way to connect to this person, Um, you know, for all of the pop culture references to girls being mean to each other. That's just never been my experience. We, I got through this election because of the women in my life and the women that were brought into my life because of this election. So I amen to that quote because we do need more women in politics. I just believe that gridlock is created by power plays and um, uh, you know, trying to keep and hold on to power, which I just, I just think women are less inclined to do. Plus, you know, we did it with men for like a really long time and only men like we could transition the other way too and just see how like how much can women get done on their own i bet in five years it could probably end war that's just me um no i really think that we we're just so underrepresented the tc pride podcast has been a production of pod letter media and twin cities pride subscribe now on itunes or google play and submit your first pride story at myfirstpride.org